Good morning to you all. New every morning is your love, great God of light, and all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors and all your creation, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a new morning of this day, September 26th. I think I have more friends who have birthdays on September 26th than I do any other day. This is the first Sunday in autumn, a beautiful day. It's a good day for the text that we are going to hear. It's a good day for the words to the hymns that we have selected to read together. We are so glad uh, this morning that our preacher is Deidre Fulton. Deidre is here from Calvary Baptist Church. Her daughter, Jada, is here also. Jada is here with her friend, uh, Katie, and Katie's mother is Mandy McMichael, who preached for us a couple weeks ago, will preach for us again in three weeks, I believe, and uh, Chad Eggleston, uh, Katie's father, Mandy's husband, will preach for us the week after that. So we are glad to make these good friends from Calvary Baptist Church here at Lakeshore. Deidre is an associate professor of Old Testament in the Department of Religion at Baylor, so you know people that she knows and works with. She knows Bill Bellinger very well, of course, Jim Nagalski, and uh, Steve Reed at Truett. She received her BA in Biblical Archaeology, and she takes trips to um, Israel most every summer until 20, 2019. We are so glad that they are here together, all, all four of these visitors from Calvary, and there, there may be more, um, and wanted to tell you that she was recently, along with Doug Weaver, the co-chair of the Pastor Search Committee at Calvary. So she is knows some of what our Lakeshore Search Committee is experiencing now. I hope you will be able to, to meet them after the service. Remember to meet outside for visiting today where it's beautiful outside instead of um, here in the sanctuary. May we worship God together. Please stand as you are able to join me in the call to worship. For the beauty of a sunny day and the comfort of friends nearby, for the invitation to love and be loved, for our God who extends that call, for time set apart to nourish the soul, for time to go out into the world equipped with love. For all these things we give thanks. Let us worship God. Join me in prayer. O oh God, we joyously come together to worship, realizing we need not summon you into our midst, for you are here. We need not call you into the secret places of our hearts, for you are there. We only need open our eyes of faith, that we may see you. Creator God, in you we live and move and have our being. You are the one who does good to all people, making your sun to rise on the evil and on the good, sending rain on the just and the unjust. Grant us gratitude as we remember your goodness, penitence as we remember our sins, and joy as we remember your love. May both our hearts and our mouths be continually filled with your praise, giving thanks to you in your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn.
I'm told it's okay to take the mask off while I speak. <laughs> um, before we begin, may I say that I very much enjoy singing these hymns. And reading them aloud is something, it's a new experience for me and for all of us, I think. But I'm finding that it actually puts focus very much on the words themselves. Often the words are prayers, as is this one. So we will read aloud slowly the phrases that speak of things that we're grateful for even in times when there may be great difficulty of one kind or another in our lives. So please pray this hymn with me. Speak it with me, please. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this, our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon, and stars of light. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony linking sense to sound and sight, Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild, Lord of all, thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. Amen. Good morning. Today we're talking a lot about joy and gratitude. And so I thought I would ask a question of us. How many here know that joy is an act of rebellion? Yeah. <laughs> joy is an act of rebellion. Joy for me is a way to hold on to light even when the days seem dark the memories of the things that bring us happiness. For example, yesterday I was able to go to Austin with one of my dearest friends as she picked out her wedding dress and as she was able to try on and experience all of the fun things of dressing up, I saw her face light up time and time again. And that is an act of joy which sits with me even when I'm at my saddest moment. And when that joy hits my heart and reminds me of the good things in this world, it is an act of rebellion to choose that joy, to choose that happiness and live into that. So this week, I encourage you, despite all of the chaos that this world has to offer, despite all the questions and doubts that might fill your mind, I hope that you choose joy Find a memory, hold it close, and let that guide you. Let's pray. 
Our God, we're grateful for the ways that you continue to show us how to live in this world. Let our hearts be guided by joy, love, mercy, and grace. And may we see you in every person we come across. In your name that we pray, amen. Now, if you will hear these words from our psalmist, who is also a rebellious person and writes about joy no matter what is going on. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims the Lord's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night pours knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes throughout all the earth, and the words of their mouths to the end of the world. In the heavens, the Lord has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from the wedding canopy, and like a strong person runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, making wise the simple, and hearing the heart of the Lord and the law as it receives and revives the soul. More to be desired are they than gold, even more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb are the words of the Lord. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is a great reward, but who can detect their errors? Clear me from their hidden faults. Keep back your servants also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And finally, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In these next moments, I invite you to sit in silence. Maybe you can find a moment of joy to hold into your memory. And maybe you can just reflect on this past week where you have seen God light up your life.
I invite you to pray with me this morning when you hear the words compassionate and loving God. Respond, hear our prayers for peace. May we pray together. Compassionate and loving God, every heart in this world needs your tender, loving care. Only you, in your mercy, knows what each of our hearts needs. We lift up all who need your compassionate and healing embrace in this fragile, hurting world. Wherever your children are, whether waking or sleeping, working or gathering food, or trying to return to a safe place, they need you. Compassionate and loving God, hear our prayers for peace. Lord, on this beautiful September day, it's hard to think of all the things that have happened in our world the last few weeks. All the news can be too much to take in at one time. Help us not become overwhelmed, but may we use the gifts you have given us, hearts to reach out, voices to call out, hands to stretch out to do the work that you are calling each one of us to do, to do the work that you are calling our church to do, not alone or through our own strength, but with each other, for each other, for our world, in your name. Compassionate and loving God, hear our prayers for peace. God, the great pandemic continues and it unveils sharp inequities within and between nations. We pray for our world leaders that they may be informed by your wisdom in this great cascade of crises on our earth. Help them know our interconnectedness, our dependence on each other from living life in the fullness, your fullness on this earth. Compassionate and loving God, Hear our prayers for peace. Lord, we pray for all those seeking a safe home in a place where freedom abounds. You've asked us to care for the vulnerable in our midst, to welcome the stranger, to look out for our neighbors. Hear our prayers this week for the Haitian people who have suffered so much in their home country, and now some of them in ours. May all who are fleeing violence and hardship find people and communities around them that nurture and strengthen them and heal them. Compassionate and loving God, hear our prayers for peace. God, give us your peace in our hearts. Give those who are troubled and confused peace in their minds. For your way, O oh God, finds us on the path of your peace that only you can give. Compassionate and loving God, hear our prayers for peace. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning. A reading from the epistle of the book of Philippians, chapters 4, verses 8 through 13. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. 
I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Where did I see God today? For the past year, my friend Elaine has been posing this question on Facebook and answering it. For months, Elaine answered this question on a daily basis, but now she's moved to a weekly post. Some of Elaine's responses to where did I see God today are in the wonder of music, in the gift of retirement, in humility, in breathing deeply. I really like that one, breathing deeply. In the gift of justice, in a candle, and, apologies to my vegetarian friends, in the fragrance of bacon. (laughs) Sorry, Katie. (laughs) These responses are accompanied by a longer explanation, helping her almost 900 Facebook friends to understand how Elaine sees God in these moments. She first posed this question during the early months of the pandemic as a way to respond to her feelings of real isolation. And I've looked forward to Elaine's post for a variety of reasons, partly her creativity, I mean, the fragrance of bacon's fantastic, but also it was really important for me to read these when I wasn't in a space to think about where I was seeing God each day. The theme of joy is similar to me in some ways. If you would ask me, where do I see joy? Where did I see that a year and a half ago? I would not have been able to respond with much eloquence. It may have been in material items like, I see joy in the grocery store still having my favorite snack. Or, and here's a big one for me, uh, I see joy in in my children attending school because I am definitely not called to be a primary or secondary school teacher teaching my children at home. I mean, if I ever had any lingering feelings, I should have been in elementary education or high school education, and that was answered for me with a resounding no over the pandemic. I regularly declare, blessed are the primary, secondary school teachers of the world. So finding joy can be difficult, and this morning I want to think about where uh, joy may be found in one of the hardest concepts for many of us to live into, and that's contentment. Contentment. Now take a minute and think. What is contentment for you? It's defined as a state of happiness or satisfaction, according to the always reliable Merriam-Webster's dictionary. And often we uh, find contentment and we connect contentment to a place or even an event rather than a state of being. And if you were to ask me when I am most content in my work life, I would say it would be after a semester has ended. Now, I really do love teaching, but what I love about the end of a semester is that no matter how the semester has gone, I feel the satisfaction and the relief of a job completed. And I love a college campus when it is just emptied out at the end of a semester. There's something about the hustle and bustle, and then you move to this empty campus, and it's it's that freedom to breathe and walk around the space. It's just a different experience. Um, I also do love the anticipation of a new semester. So you've completed the one, and you get to turn to the next and think about what's coming next. I love that. And as for places, I have several that bring me a state of contentment for a time. My parents' farm in Ohio brings me a lot of contentment, and the ocean brings me a lot of contentment. I love looking over the ocean and the vastness of the water, and that there's just nothing blocking your view. Love that. So our Bible passages for today focus on joy, specifically the joy the psalmist feels, as well as Paul's exhortation in, to rejoice in contentment, written to the church in Philippi. And and let me just say, it is a gutsy move for me to preach anything on the Psalms at Lakeshore Baptist Church. (laughs) You have the world's most famous, some of the world's most famous Psalm scholars here uh, amongst you, um, although they might be joining us uh, remotely today, Steve Reed, Bill Bellinger, and Jim Nagalski. They're all members here. So I will charge forward and I accept any corrections you may have later if you're watching. (laughs) 
<laughs> Psalm 19. So in Psalm 19, we open with an image of creation, and the psalmist proclaims, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Verses 3 through 4 describe the creation without a word being said. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. You have what Walter Brueggemann and Bill Bellinger call an interesting paradox. The heavens proclaim God, but there is no sound. This unheard, voice, this unheard sound persists through all of creation and is open for all. Verses 5 through 6 personify the sun as a bridegroom going out of the marriage tent in superhero terms. And to quote Brueggemann and Ballinger again, the image is like a strong person who runs the course with joy. The overall image of verses 1 through 6 is that creation is glorious, and the psalmist tells us this in excited language. The second part of Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10, are the most familiar for me. I grew up singing at the chorus of this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So where is joy found? The psalmist tells us joy is found in the decrees, the precepts, the commandments, fear and ordinances of the Lord, in the law, the Torah of the Lord. It is not rooted in a status or a place. It's not rooted in your income level or a promotion. Joy is found in the divine instructions for living, Torah. Joy is found in the divine decrees, which are trustworthy. And finally, the precepts of God's commandments bring us joy. How may one live out these teachings? I think by the final meditations found in the psalm, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. What a beautiful exhortation and worthy for us to remember. And take a moment and think about why these words are wise. If you follow the ways of God, the life teachings of Torah, then the outcome should be pleasing words and pleasing thoughts. But the law is really big. <laughs> I studied the Old Testament, it's really a big law. So how may we actively live out this law? Well, I think we may be content to live out the law the way Jesus conceives it. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus summarizes it so well when Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest of commandments. And the second is like this, Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And you can see these ideals firmly rooted in examples like the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, to name a few places in the Old Testament that says to love God and to love your neighbor. This Torah, this law, is what revives the soul and brings us joy. Now turning to the New Testament, the book of Philippians may give us the most guidance for how Christians should live a life of joy in contentment. The letter to the church in Philippi focuses on unity, and it appears that the church was struggling with this. And just as a reminder for us all, Paul wrote this entire letter from prison. After using the examples of Christ, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, and Paul's own life, Paul addresses a specific conflict among two church leaders, Euodia and Syntyche. Their disagreements were causing conflict, and Paul exhorts them in verse 3 to be of one mind in the Lord. And we know, based on the description of these two women, that they were working with Paul to spread the gospel. The term used for their work, which is the same term used for Clement and several other unnamed people as well, is synergoi. And this term is frequently used for those who are involved in evangelistic work in Paul's writings. So Paul asks the rest of the community to help those two in their conflict, 
But also, he makes clear that Euodia and Syntyche have been faithful in their struggle for Christ, and their names are in the book of life, he says. So it's not a matter of salvation. It's not a matter of their commitment to Christ. It's a matter of unity. So Paul states in verse 4, he ends this with, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Paul really likes to remind people to rejoice. Beverly Gaventa sums it up this way. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul has reminded his audience that they re uh, received the word with joy. In Philippians 4, Paul writes similar similarly, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. In Galatians 5, he includes joy in his list of the fruits of the Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 6, he describes the life of Christian workers as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And in Romans 12, he includes rejoicing in hope as one of the identifying markers of the Christian life. And in the Philippians text we read today, Paul concludes his teachings with an exhortation. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, whatever is, what, or sorry, I skipped up a line, now I gotta go back. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. I didn't want to add more whatevers to the text. That was really what it said. Paul is telling the church in Philippi what to think about, what to do, and where contentment may be found. In thought and in action. In our, cogni our, our cognition and in our behavior. These go together. And while these six adjectives, true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, and commendable, that Paul uses are very broad, just in case you missed anything, he adds, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. In the earlier part of Philippians, Paul is asking the church to be humble, and he returns to that theme in verses 10 through 13 of chapter 4. He says, he's speaking of his own humility at this point, and he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, and of having plenty and of being in need. Again, we have to remember Paul is in prison as he writes this letter to the church of Philippi. He is speaking from real experience here, and he speaks of being in need, of being hungry. But the way Paul writes about suffering is through what he has learned and what he knows. He writes in behavioral and cognitive terms, that is, in his experiences and reflections on these experiences that have brought him closer to Christ. He concludes his thoughts with, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Doing all things is not, of course, about being able to do whatever we want. Like, I am never going to run a marathon. That is just not going to happen. <laughs> I am 5'4". I will never dunk a basketball unless somebody has lowered the, the uh, uh, hoop quite a bit. It's never going to happen. But doing all things through Christ is about being able to endure anything with God's help. That's what that's about, I think. So both of the scripture readings for today find joy and contentment firmly rooted in the Lord. And this is an opportunity, uh, this is an opportunity for us to think about this. This is really what is opposite what we are often trained to think. Contentment is not, it's not your job, it's not your partner or your spouse, it's not your health, it's not your house, it's not a bank account. It's not a clever status on social media. It's not your next vacation. It's not your friend group. It's not your children. And if we are looking for our contentment in these things, then we've missed where true spiritual contentment, where joy should be found. Paul, who is imprisoned and indicates he has been very ill, tells us that true contentment is found in Christ. And one of the two mar true markers of Christians, according to Romans 12, is that we rejoice in hope. So, if I can give you homework, <laughs> here's my charge to you. If joy and contentment is something you struggle with, 
certainly something I struggle with. Then remember that we are supposed to actively be searching for it, for searching for this every day. So get a notebook and write it down. Emulate my friend Elaine's post. Emulate Paul and actively seek to find your joy in contentment, in Christ who strengthens us. Because here's the thing, there will always be a reason to not find joy. There will always be deadlines and disappointments, and people are going to always let us down from what we expect. But if we do not let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts focus on the Lord, then we are not looking for joy. So consider where you find joy and where you see God every single day. For today, where did you see God? Is it in the fragrance of bacon? Is it in breathing deeply? Is it in a candle? For me, I see joy in getting to worship with you today. I see God in the change of the rhythm of my Sabbath routine. And to quote Milo, I am going to choose joy for that. I'm going to choose joy for that reason. And so to end, I send up the exhortation that may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. You are my rock and my redeemer. As Judy so well instructed us earlier, let us pray these words together in response to all of the joy that we find. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, Drive our fear and doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee. Earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth, of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. Now hear this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the Lord's countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.